Let's talk about the future of the Vancouver Canucks, and in particular, three names on the team. Well, two of them are on the team, another one is behind the bench of the team, that each garner their own discussion as to what the Canucks should do in the next few years. We're going over JT Miller, we're going over Brock Besser, and we're going over Bruce Boudreau as well. In fact, let's start out with Bruce There It Is Baby himself, because he had himself a press conference following the Canucks practice at noon earlier today, talking about whether or not he has earned the right to a contract extension. Here's the quote as to whether or not that's the case. I think I've done an okay job. It's a tough question, though. I want to coach forever, and I really like Vancouver, so I guess that answers the question. And so, when it comes to Bruce Boudreaux, everybody kind of recognizes what happened with his contract signing situation. He was signed on for two years, although I do believe the second year in his contract is optional with Patrick Alvine and the rest of the Canucks executive staff because of the way mid-season hirings work and stuff like that. It's whatever. But either way, Bruce Boudreaux, at the end of the day, is only signed on for this season as well as next year, assuming the Canucks want to go over and pursue that. Whether or not he'd be interested in sticking around long-term, Term remains to be seen, because I don't know if you know this, but Bruce Boudreaux is not the youngest guy in the world. I love Bruce Boudreaux, but the guy is already 67 years old. By the time he reaches 70, 72, 73, is he going to be wanting to coach a Vancouver Canucks team that, according to some, might need to blow it up and start a full-on rebuild once again? Now, I'm not saying that that's going to happen, it's just an extreme hyperbolic example to illustrate a point I'm trying to make. Would Bruce Boudreaux be interested in sticking around long-term with a team that might not be the most guaranteed playoff successor year in and year out? Because, I mean, he said he loved Vancouver and he wants to coach forever, but he is getting up there. Let's say the Canucks decide to go out there and trade away Miller. They trade away... Bo, and they trade away Brock, and they trade away Garland, they keep Petey, they keep Hughes, they keep Demko, and they build everybody else from scratch in the draft, and you see this team maybe remain competitive in 2025, 2026, 2027, or 28. Bruce Boudreaux in that time frame is gonna be like 72, 73 years old, and I don't know if he'd want to go through four or five years of quote-unquote rebuilding when we have seen out of this season that he is a very legitimately good coach that knows how to get the most out of his players when given that Bruce bump. Now, recently, fatigue has started to set in with the team, and you can see them go out there and play not as well as you kind of expect them to play, and that Bruce bump has sort of worn off. But for a good chunk of this season after he got hired, the Canucks were a really good team, and we saw in certain games where they still lost that, hey, they can perform pretty well, especially under the system that Boudreaux provides. It's not the same Travis Green cut-and-paste, dump-and-chase kind of thing that they had going on there, and Bruce just kind of knows how to do it right. And so, if it's up to me, and I want the Canucks to get the best results possible on the ice, I'm keeping Bruce 100%, I'm extending this guy for as long as he'd be interested in staying in Vancouver, but... I'm not too sure if it's 100% guaranteed that he'd be interested in sticking around long term as well, especially if the team goes out there and maybe in the offseason trades away some of the better players, they get some draft picks, they sign some younger guys, and the team is projected to being even worse on paper next year than they were this year. Then we go over on to some of the guys that might be in that conversation as to whether or not they can be traded. J.T. Miller is the big one right here, and the conversations on Miller are pretty interesting. This is what I wanted to open up this conversation with. It was Elliot Friedman and Donnie and Dolly saying this on March 28th. The next J.T. Miller contract is going to be in the Mika Zibanejad area. $8.5 million a year. We also had the sentiment that it would probably be eight years long, and ultimately, if you're going to go out there and give J.T. Miller, of all people, an eight-year by $8.5 million contract deal, there's nothing to go out there and say that Miller is not worth that money right now. Like, he is a 100-point pace player in the National Hockey League. That is fantastic. He is almost at 82 points on the year. He's got 81 in 67 games played right now. He's going to hit 30. He's two away from 30. He's going to be the first 30-goal scorer the team has had since Radim freaking Verbata in 2014-15. Miller has been fantastic, and there's nothing to go out there and dispute the idea that he should be worth, at the very least, like eight-something million dollars for what he is providing right now. It's just the same conversation brings itself up again. Miller is 29 years old. He is in the prime of his career, and 
Who's to say that if you sign Miller to an $8.5 million by eight-year deal, he's going to be worth $8.5 million for the next eight years? If you sign Miller to an 8.5 by, let's say, two-year deal or a three-year deal, yeah, he's probably worth it then because by the time he's 31, 32, 33, he might start to decline a little bit and you can probably go out there and assume that he's not going to be an $8.5 million caliber player anymore. It's just when you're playing in a position like Miller has where he has been just more of a tweener throughout the entire spectrum of his career. He's been in the middle of the lineup in the Rangers. He was a bottom sixer with the Lightning, and now he's in Vancouver where he's a star. If this is your chance to get paid and secure, what, $67 million, you go out there and do that. You do it. It's just how contracts work and how sporting things work for players like these. It's just... For the Vancouver Canucks, can they afford to do that? There are probably, most definitely, teams in the NHL that would be willing to pay Miller that amount of money based off of what he's done this season and last season and the year before that in Vancouver. It's just, are the Canucks the team that should go out there and do that? Who really knows? There's the entire sentiment about rebuilding and taking a look at the assets you can get for Miller in a trade, etc., etc., and maybe trying to force your hand into getting younger at the same time, but... At the end of the day, I said this before, I'll say it again, whether or not the Canucks trade Miller, they trade him at the draft, they trade him at the start of next season, they trade him with a contract extension attached to it to any other team that already pre-negotiates these things, whether or not the Canucks do that or they don't. The biggest thing to me is that they do not settle. Do not trade away JT Miller for anything less than he is worth because you don't want to see Ryan Kessler go over to Anaheim, become another Selkie Trophy candidate, and have yourself stuck with Benino, Spiza, Jared McCann, whom you trade away for Eric Branson alongside of a second-round pick. You trade away Benino for Sutter and you lose Spiza to the expansion draft. The Ryan Kessler trade didn't do anything for the Vancouver Canucks. If you're taking a look at it a few years down the line, Kessler had some good years with Anaheim, and that was that, but Vancouver ultimately just didn't get enough. And the Canucks cannot afford to do that here with JT Miller, the most valuable asset the team has had in a very long time, the best player this team has had since prime Sedins in the 2010-2011 era. Seriously, go ahead and look. No Canuck has had more points than JT Miller has had since those Sedins, and it's kind of wild that we're even going out there and saying those two in the same breath as JT Miller. Now going over onto the last guy I wanted to talk about here, Brock Besser. Besser is in a strange, strange position because he's still got that contract extension looming in the background. He doesn't have a contract for next year. He's an RFA, so there are some retained rights the Vancouver Canucks do have, but there are indeed some more money talks that you need to go out there and acknowledge. Okay, if you qualify this guy, it's $7.5 million, the qualifying offer. Is Brock Besser worth 7.5? Heck, is Brock Besser worth 5.875 like he's making this season? This year, he's got 38 points in 63 games played. If he finishes off the year with this amount of production, which is on pace for 46 points in 76 games, this would be a career low in points per game. And I can't believe I just said that. Brock Besser this year is the worst version of Brock Besser that the Canucks have had for his entire career, and that blows my mind. And so now you take a look at it and you say, well... I mean, 7.5, you're not going to go ahead and qualify that contract to get that $7.5 million qualifying offer on the books, right? But at the same time, if you try to negotiate a contract with Brock Besser, who's to say he's going to be like, yeah, well, I made $5.875 million when I was 22 years old. Now I'm 25. Give me more. Do we really have any idea where these contract negotiations are going to go? Because I'll give credit to Jim Betting for one thing and one thing only. When it comes to the RFA contract signings, he always did a really good job with those. Berchi, Vertanen, Besser, Bo, Demko, these contracts that Benning signed were great. Not the ones for the other players that were not RFA, so like the good Bransons and the Sutters, etc. It was kind of whack what he did there. But for RFAs, the young guys coming off of entry-level deals, coming off of before 25 deals, he was really good at signing these. And so for Brock Besser, I kind of wish that there was some Jim Benning expertise in this situation. Hey, Brock, you produced at X amount of points back when you were 22. You're producing less now. You're not going to get that 7.5. We're not going to qualify you like that. You might not even get $5.8 million. And if Brock Besser goes out there and does not want that, then unfortunately you have to make a decision that nobody wants to see. Or I guess some people want to see it, actually. I mean, I take that back. Yeah. 
Patrick Alvin said this when Tyler Mott got traded. They just could not agree on an extension, and so that's why he had to get sent away for a fourth. For Brock, it might be in a similar boat, but there is RFA status here, so it's not the same entirely, but... Either way, you can let me know in the comments all your thoughts about Bruce Boudreaux, JT Miller, and Brock Besser, the future of these guys, and their stories within the Canucks organization. Do you stay or do you go? Let me know in the comments who do you think does which. I hope you enjoyed this video. Nine. And bye.